Mr. Friedman, how much government intervention do you think is necessary to prevent the rise of monopoly and oligopoly under the free enterprise system, or would it take care of itself? If left well, alone? I believe if you examine, uh, the, if you examine uh, the sources of monopoly and oligopoly, you will find that almost all those sources are government intervention. I think the situation is almost precisely the reverse. Let me put it in a very simple way. Suppose I were to ask this audience my favorite question along these lines. You have one law you can pass. Its only purpose is to reduce the extent of monopoly. That's its only purpose. You have one law. What law would be most effective in achieving that end? What law would you pass? <laughs> I don't mean any gimmicks. You know, it's not going to be something in which you can have a law with 4,000 different parts. I'm not asking a very complicated question. What would you do? Limit the size of the market that they could. Well, have. that's one proposal, the limit is proposal. But you will agree with me, I'm sure, immediately that mine is a much better one. <laughs> and that's free trade. Eliminate all tariffs and all restrictions on foreign trade, and you enable the world to come in as competition to prevent domestic monopoly. Wouldn't that do a great deal more good in preventing monopoly? than would a limit on the size of enterprises with much less restriction in human freedom? Now, if you ask yourself, <laughs> ask yourself, where do monopolies come from? In the United States, the most important and the strongest monopolies are unquestionably those that derive from governmental privilege. Uh, the monopoly of a TV license granted by the government at a zero price that's a source of monopoly privilege. It also has been a source of wealth for some notable Americans. <laughs> the, uh, grant of a, uh, the grant of a tariff protection, would the steel industry in the United States have any kind of monopoly or oligopoly position if it weren't able to get the government to impose, uh, impose restrictions on imports of foreign items and so on? Uh, trade union monopolies, they get their strength and their support from Davis-Bacon Act, Walsh-Healy Act, other governmental measures that interfere with competition by others. It's very hard. In fact, I have tried to, I have tried to uh, consider, and George Stigler is a greater authority on this than I, so we, maybe we ought to get him in to uh, add to this, what private monopolies there are that have been able to maintain themselves over any long period of time without government assistance. And I have myself only been able to construct two. One is an international one, the De Beers Diamond Monopoly. It really is an extra, I don't understand it, maybe George can tell us the answer. But it has been successful over a very long period. And the second was the New York Stock Exchange. Not more recently, because since 1934 it's had the help of the SEC. But before 1934, from about the Civil War to 1934, so far as I know it had no government support and yet it did maintain an effective monopoly. But almost every other case, you have temporary monopolies develop, and if the government doesn't come in to shore them up, they fall to pieces. The railroads became a monopoly only because they were able to get the Interstate Commerce Commission established. Trucking is a monopoly because the ICC keeps out competitors. And you can go down the line and find that one hypothetical monopoly case after another derives from governmental assistance and support. So I think the answer to your question, and you and I have the same objective here, is less government intervention, not more. <laughs>